welcome to the KU TV. This is teacher Manase, a teacher at the KBA group of schools Kahawa West. And I welcome all of us to the program that runs from Monday to Friday for primary school and also high school, especially for class eight, primary school. And for high school, it is for form fours. So today I'll be taking you through the English lesson, class eight, and I will be looking at sentences. Now, in any profession where serious communication is a mandate, like teaching, law, and business, you realize that communication is very key. And that is to say that whenever you make your presentation or you're communicating, there's a language that is used. And here today, I'm, I'm here just to put things very easy for candidates, especially the ones in class eight, but still I'll be traversing the other sections. I'll be looking at the lower primary, uh, middle, upper, and also the upper primary classes. So you realize that sentences, they emanate from words. If you put many words together, you come up with what you call a phrase. Then if you put many phrases together, you come up with what is called a clause. And then many clauses, a clause is comprised of a subject and a verb, which is so basic. Then when you put clauses together, you come up with sentences. And then the sentences, as many as you use them, you come up with paragraphs and many, many paragraphs put together, you come up with what we call a story. So today I want us to look at sentences, and to begin with, we will be defining what a sentence is. So, a sentence is a group of words that expresses a complete thought. So whenever you use a sentence, there is that expression of a complete thought. And sentences always have a subject. So a sentence expresses complete thought or idea. That is the basic meaning of a sentence. Whenever you want to put something across, we use sentences to communicate. And then we have said that a sentence expresses an idea or thought. Number two, a sentence always has a subject So a sentence has a subject, then it also has what we call a verb. So these are the two components of a sentence to make it a complete thought. For example, you will have the subject, then the verb on this other end. I'm just using the very simple sentences here to bring the idea home. Number one, Owen is playing. This is a basic sentence. Owen is playing, Owen is the subject, and the verb is playing. Number two, Anne is reading. In this example, 
an is a subject, reading is a verb. Another example, the pupils are playing. In this sentence, the pupils is a, is a subject and then are playing is a verb. Having said that, those are the basic examples I can use just to define what a sentence is and it is as simple as that, a subject and a verb. I want us now to look at four types of sentences. Four types of sentences. Four types of sentences. So the first type of a sentence I want us to look at what we call a declarative sentence. Four types of sentences. The first one is called a declarative declarative sentence. A declarative sentence is a sentence that makes a statement and ends with a full stop. This is a sentence that makes a statement and it ends with a full stop. This is what we call a declarative sentence. It is a sentence that makes a basic statement and it ends with a full stop. So as we continue, there's a number there. You can be sending your questions. I'll be responding to them in due course. And then I'll be giving examples of what we call declarative sentences. One, it is called in July. It is called in July. This is an example of a declarative sentence. It is just a statement made. It, it, and it ends with a full stop. Then number two. Melvin likes football. Melvin likes football is also a declarative sentence. In that, it is a statement made and it ends with a full stop. Another example I want us to have is this one. Another example of a declarative sentence. We are looking at types of sentences. COVID-19 is a global pandemic. COVID-19 is a global pandemic. That is also another example of a declarative sentence. Having said that, we move to another example of a sentence, and this is called an, inter an interrogative sentence. Example number two. An interrogative sentence from the word interrogate. An interrogative sentence. This type of a sentence that interrogates makes a statement 
sorry, an interrogative sentence is a sentence that seeks or asks questions and normally they end with question marks, interrogative sentences. Interrogative sentences ask questions. Whenever you want to interrogate, they ask questions. They ask questions. And normally, they normally end with a question mark. They normally end with a question mark. So they, they seek out to interrogate. They seek out to ask, to inquire, and therefore they end with question marks. That is an interrogative sentence, and I want to give a few examples. An example of an interrogative question or sentence. Number one, where is the baby? Where is the baby? This is an example of an interrogative sentence. Number two, another example of interrogative sentence. Why is the sky? Why is the sky blue? Why is the sky blue is another example of an interrogative sentence. Another one, who is shouting at the gate is an example of an interrogative sentence. Interrogative sentences seek out clarification by asking questions, by inquiring with the aim of wanting to know. Then we have another example of a sentence. We are looking at examples of sentences, and there are four. Example number three is what we call, example number three of a sentence is what we call exclamatory sentence. An exclamatory sentence. An exclamatory sentence makes a very strong statement. This sentence makes a very strong statement. It makes a very strong statement in communication. An exclamatory sentence. Now, unlike the first one, where we talked about a declarative, where a statement is made at it and it ends with a full stop, and then we looked at number two, exclamatory state, uh, uh, an interrogative sentence where it aims to, to seek answers, to ask and inquire. An exclamatory sentence, this one, it makes a strong, it makes a strong statement. This one makes a strong statement, and in most cases, they end with exclamation marks. That is why we have the word 
exclamatory and with exclamation marks and this is the sign of an exclamation mark so for these types of sentences exclamatory sentences they are used to make strong statements and especially they are used to show feelings so there is that also element of expressing they express feelings for example for example they can be used to express one surprise they are used to express surprise whenever somebody is surprised an exclamatory sentence is used to express their feelings number two it can also be used to express anger whenever somebody is angry or disappointed this exclamatory sentence is used to express their feelings i want us to look at examples of exclamatory sentences like now we are staying at home because of the covid-19 pandemic so most of the time whenever we see the cabinet secretary and the health, the ministry of health whenever they come to address us most of the time they use exclamatory sentences to express feelings to express um, anger sometimes whenever people are not whenever people are not keeping distance whenever people are not wearing masks in public places whenever people are ignoring washing of hands and all that the types of sentences used to express such disappointment are what we call exclamatory sentences here are examples of exclamatory sentences example number 1 for instance what long hair you have what long hair you have is an example of an exclamatory sentence number 2 what kind of a what a kind thing to do is another example of an exclamatory sentence another one example of exclamatory sentence he fell with a thud he fell with a thud is an example of an exclamatory sentence they are used to show strong feelings for example surprise or anger then i want us to move to the last type of a sentence and this sentence is called an imperative sentence it is called an imperative sentence sentence number 4 of the types an imperative an imperative sentence what is an imperative sentence an imperative sentence is a sentence that gives an order 
an imperative sentence ends with an exclamation mark just like exclamatory if that order is very firm so imperative sentences they give order they give order or orders then they end with an exclamation mark they end with an exclamation mark if the order is very strong they are used to give orders and an exclamation mark is used if that order is very strong so having looked at the four types of sentences i have spoken about a declarative sentence these are sentences that make statements then we looked at interrogative sentences they are the ones that are used to ask questions then we looked at exclamatory sentences they are used to express emotions either of anger or surprise then the last one is an imperative sentence and we have said that for this sentence they are used to give orders and i'm going to give examples for example tell teddy to come and mop the floor that is an example of an imperative sentence it is an order example of an imperative sentence number 1 tell teddy to come and mop the floor this is an order so it does not have to end with an exclamation mark because it is not a strong order then number 2 go to your room unlike this first example given of an imperative sentence where an order is given and it looks light you don't use an exclamation mark but the second one is a strong statement go to your room go to your room it ends with an exclamation mark maybe at home there some of you are so jumpy you don't stay indoors and the ministry of health directive state that we stay indoors of course to avert the spread of the virus so if you don't stay indoors maybe your parents can tell you go to your room as an order that is an example of an imperative sentence another example please leave please leave this example 3 you don't use an exclamation mark because it's it's not that strong you're just asking somebody to exit you're asking somebody to leave therefore you don't use an exclamation mark and then the last sentence on the same shut the door shut the door this order is very strong therefore somebody is being instructed to shut the door and it's very serious it could be there's an animal that wants to get into the house and devour people so you don't take chances of saying please shut the door you know the animal might come and 
we become lunch in this place. No, shut the door. It is an, a strong order. And that is it. So having said that, I want us to move to the next level. I want us to look at what we call verbs with objects in relation to sentences. Verbs with objects. want us to look at verbs with objects and then I will tell you what they mean the other name for verbs with the objects they are also called transitive verbs verbs with objects they are also called transitive transitive verbs verbs with objects. Now, the basic definition of a verb, a verb is an action or a doing word. For example, jump, an action word, skip, cry, shout. Those are examples of verbs. So the basic definition of a verb again, a verb is an action or doing word. Whenever you want to express an action, we use verbs. For example, jump is a verb. Speak is a verb. Walk is a verb. Right? They express action or they are used to, to say what happens. Those are verbs. Then we'll be looking at an object later as I go by. So, the subject of a sentence does something. Whenever we look at verbs with objects, we normally have what we call subject. The subject in a sentence is the doer. In other words, does the action. The subject in a sentence is the doer, the one doing the action or executing the action. Then we have what we call an object because we are looking at verbs with objects. The object in a sentence receives the action of the verb They receive the action of the verb. Remember that action, we say it action or doing words. We are looking at verbs with objects or transitive verbs. For example, I'll be having something like a table. So let me use this other part so that it can be very clear to you boys and girls at home and those who are tuned I know you are so many and you are following very very closely as you keep distance and also as you wash your hands and follow the directives given by the Ministry of Health to avert COVID-19 so we have on this other side subject then at the center we will be having what we call transitive verb. The subject, transitive verb. And finally, on this side, we'll be having the object. Example, Alvin is reading a book. Alvin is reading a book. Verbs with objects. In this sentence, the subject is Alvin, and what Alvin is doing is reading. Reading is what we call transitive verb, and then the object here is a book. So, Alvin 
is the subject, he is the doer. He's the one doing the action here, which is a verb, is reading, and what is being read is an object, which is book. Verbs with objects. Number two, mother likes her new dress. Mother likes her new dress. In example two, mother is the subject, likes is the verb, which is transitive, and finally her new dress is the object. Another example, the dog caught the thief. The dog caught the thief. In this example, the dog is the subject and the dog is doing the catching, that act is a transitive verb. And finally, what is being caught, the object there is the thief. So those are examples of verbs with objects. In other words, they are also called transitive verbs. They are also called transitive verbs. But we have also other verbs that do not take objects. We call them verbs with no objects or intransitive verbs. Verbs with no objects. The other group as we look at sentences this morning, are called verbs without objects. Verbs without objects or intransitive. Intransitive verbs. Unlike the first group, we said that for that group, there is a subject, there is a, a verb, which is an action word, and finally, an object. For this case, they do not have verbs. They do not have objects. So we say verbs without objects do not take objects in their sentences. An object is not there. The way we have demar demarcated this one for transitive verbs that they have the subject there is a transitive verb and finally an object. Verbs that do not have objects, they are just that way. And I'll be giving examples on the same. Some verbs do not have an object. A verb that does not have an object is called a transitive verb. A verb that not have an object is called intransitive. They are called intransitive verbs. Actually, it is just the opposite of transitive. It is the opposite of transitive. An example, the moon is shining.
This is an example of intransitive verb. You can see the moon is the object. I mean the moon is the subject and there is no object. So this is the subject here, the moon. And then we have the verb here is shining. And then the object is not there. An example of intransitive verb. Example number two. The lady smiled. The lady smiled. In this case, the lady is the subject and smiled is the verb and an object is not there. Another example of intransitive verb, Mr. Mzalendo walks to work. Mr. Mzalendo here is the subject and walks to work is a verb, therefore no object. So those are the two examples of verbs that we have in English, whenever we talk about sentences, we have verbs without objects. They are called intransitive verbs, and they are also used in communication. And then we have verbs with objects. They are very commonly used. They are called transitive verbs. So having said that, I want us to look at other sentences. I want us to look at other sentences. We have other groups called simple sentences. And this topic is cutting across all the sections, the preschool. We don't want to see learners using some funny sentences. For example, you are going where, you see, that kind of spoken English. I did do my work, mixture of verbs and all that. Whenever these learners speak and they come to school, they must go through systems that can help them speak good English. So, I want us to look now at simple sentences, the basic ones where we can communicate in a very simple way so that we avert that. So we have simple sentences. And this sentences, a clause is a group of words that contain one subject and one verb. So for simple sentences, for simple sentences, we have what we call a clause. They are made from what we call clause. And this clause has one subject, has one subject and one verb. This is a clause and they are used to construct simple sentence. Simple sentences are clause. It contains one subject and one verb. So, a sentence that contains one clause and one verb is called a simple sentence. So we say, a simple sentence contains one, one subject and one verb. So whenever you construct sentences and you're using a simple subject, which is one, and you're also using a verb, which is one, that sentence is what we call a simple sentence. For example, the girls are playing netball. Examples.
the girls are playing netball. This is an example of a simple sentence here. So the girls, this is the subject, and then are playing netball is a verb, are playing, actually, is a, is a simple, is one verb. Then number two, the sky was very clear. Another simple sentence, the sky was very The sky was very clear. Is another example of a simple sentence. One subject and one verb. Another one. Will you help me? Will you help me? Is another example of a simple sentence. Will you help me? a question. Will you help me? So, that is an example of a simple sentence. You is the subject and the help is the verb. Then we have another one, compound sentences from simple. Now we move to another example of a, of a sentence, compound sentences. Unlike the first one where we said it has it has one subject and one verb for compound sentences, we can say that a compound sentence contains two cl clauses joined by a conjunction. Compound sentences contain two clauses joined by a conjunction. So these conjunctions can either be and, so, or, so that you join the first part and the second part to make it a compound sentence. I want to give an example of a compound sentence. We have said they have two clauses joined together by, by, by what we call a conjunction, the joining word. She opened her bag and packed her books. This is an example of a compound sentence. She opened her bag is the first clause, joined by and, then the next clause, packed her books. The other one, and the last example of a compound sentence, do you want coffee or you prefer lemonade? Do you want coffee? Or you prefer lemonade? It's a question. In this sentence, do you want coffee? It's the first clause. Joined by a conjunction or you prefer 
lemonade. That is an example of a compound sentence. So keep your questions coming. I'm going to respond to them in a short while here at KUTV. Keep your questions coming and I'm going to respond to them in a short while. So one is called it is, this is Brenda from Kiambu and you're asking I am Brenda from Kiambu what is imperative I will respond to that then another one teacher when we say a verb is a doing word is teaching also a doing word that's a very good question I want to begin by responding to Brenda teaching is a verb it's an it's an action for example what i'm doing right now i am teaching so teaching is a doing word it is an action word then the, the question that brenda asked about imperative imperative is an order it is to implore when you want to instruct sometimes we use orders and the sentences that we looked i use an example of shut the door that is an imperative it is to implore to ask something to do so, uh, to ask somebody to do something i hope i'm very clear let me ask another one another person is is saying hi purity from baringo the words came to an end could be replaced with Maybe you resend your question, it's not very clear. And then another one. I would like to ask the employees who will dash paid for by the end of this week will speak to the manager about it. The employees the employees who will dash paid for by the end of this week, we'll speak to the manager about it. Answers have not been, not have been, have been not, not have been. What is considered in answering such a question? Now, in this kind of a question, you look at the statement, the employees who will, and then you look at the last bit of it. For example, this one says the employees who will dash paid for by the end of the week will speak to the manager about it. The, the correct answer is who will not have been paid. Because you see the second part says they will speak to the manager. So there is that act. They are supposed to be paid, but it could be their hindrances that make them not to be paid. So the correct answer is who will not have been paid. Another question, who will not have been paid, sorry? Not have been paid. The correct answer there is D. Another person is saying, I am Mish from Baringo. Which sentence ask questions? Which sentence ask questions? Then another one, teacher, kindly explain the declarative statement again. Blessing from Baringo. Declarative statements, they are used just from the word to declare. Declarative statements. Let me get back to you in a, in a short while about declarative statements or sentences. And this is somebody from Baringo. And I'm so much happy you are tuned from far and wide. A declarative sentence is just a statement. They make statements and mostly they end with full stops. So they are basic statements ending with full stops. Those are examples of 
declarative sentences. Let me respond to the last question. Okay. Joy from Kayole, can a compound sentence have more than one conjunction? Yes, it can have more than one conjunction, but do not make it too long. They become very clumsy and they lose meaning. So thank you for watching. Let's keep here at KU TV. Keep safe at home. Let us make sure we are safe. We are waiting for you when the schools reopen. Thank you. God bless. Kenyatta University Career Week 2023, starting this Saturday the 28th, the ever-entertaining, educative and energizing high school fair will be taking place at the university's graduation square from 9 a.m. The event is open to all high school students free of charge. Join us and learn more on the academic programs and interact with different faculties. Public lectures on topical issues will be taking place between Monday and Wednesday with corporate exhibitions scheduled for Thursday the 2nd and Friday 3rd February. The official opening ceremony will take place on Thursday 2nd February at the graduation square from 1 p.m. This year's theme is dubbed Digital Disruptions, the Future of Work in a Hybrid World. Be part of us as we mark the 2023 Career Week Fair. Maelfu na maelfu ya wahamiaji wakiwa na watoto kutoka nchi za Amerika ya Kati wanaendelea kuwasili kwenye mpaka kati ya Marekani na Mexico. The folks are going. Thank you very very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ni habari kutoka pembe zote duniani. Pepo pasi kukupupe. Pepo pa ni idea. Tazidi ananyonya, hanyonyi vizuri. Anakuwa hayuko comfortable. Jishi la Jamburi ya Kilipresi ya Kongo. Nina pambana na wasi wa ADF. Amen. Welcome to Children's Corner. I am. Welcome to Children's Corner. Children's Corner. Oh my goodness.
the Mandela Effect, the science behind our collective false memories. Did you ever start watching a movie on TV with your friends and see an actor or actress who you and your friends remember as having died? Then a quick Google search assures you that they're very much alive. This common occurrence is called the Mandela Effect, and it is a collective misremembering of a fact or event. The term Mandela Effect was first coined by the paranormal enthusiast Fiona Broom, who along with people from all over the world remembered former South African President Nelson Mandela as having died in prison during the 1980s. People even remembered watching Mandela's funeral on TV during the 1980s. In fact, after 27 years in prison, Nelson Mandela was released, went on to become South Africa's president, and didn't die until 2013. A similar example of the Mandela effect is the canonization of Mother Teresa. People from different countries have a distinct memory of seeing Mother Teresa being canonized during her lifetime sometime in 1990s by Pope Paul II. In reality, her canonization didn't occur until September 4, 2016, 19 years after her death. On June 5, 1989, during the Tiananmen Square protest in China, many people remember seeing the lone man who stood in front of the tanks rolling into the square be run over and killed. In actuality, that never happened. Many people remember the color chartreuse as being a reddish purple or magenta color. Chartreuse is actually a yellowish green color. People remember the band Queen's song, We Are The Champions, as ending with no time for losers, cause we are the champions of the world. But its final lyric actually is, no time for losers, cause we are the champions. In the popular Star Wars film, The Empire Strikes Back, most of us would swear that Darth Vader told Luke Skywalker, Luke, I am your father. In reality, Vader said, No, I am your father. Even the famous phrase from Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs isn't safe from misremembering. The evil queen never said, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? She actually said, Magic mirror on the wall. What is causing this collective misremembering? Modern psychological theory holds that memory is constructive, not reproductive. That means our brains build memories on the fly out of pieces of information, as opposed to playing memories back like a recording. Because of that, our memories can be distorted by bias, association, imagination, or even peer pressure. A possible quantum explanation for the Mandela Effect was put forth by physicist Fred Allen Wolf. He defined a difference between the reality in our dreams and the reality during our waking hours. Wolf describes quantum physics as being made up of probabilities, and out of those probabilities, actualities manifest. Wolf maintains that the collective unconscious manifests in our dreams and reflects what the entire planet as a whole is experiencing. Sometimes the Mandela effect is so strong that it overtakes reality. People remember a character from the movie Gremlins as being named Spike. In actuality, the character was named Stripe. But bending to the Mandela effect, in November 2016, a t-shirt featuring the character Spike was released for sale. Kenyatta University Career Week 2023, starting this Saturday the 28th, the ever-entertaining, educative, and energizing high school fair will be taking place at the university's graduation square from 9 a.m. The event is open to all high school students free of charge. Join us and learn more on the academic programs and interact with different faculties. Public lectures on topical issues will be taking place between Monday and Wednesday with corporate exhibitions scheduled for Thursday the 2nd and Friday 3rd February. 
The official opening ceremony will take place on Thursday, 2nd February at the graduation square from 1 p.m. This year's theme is dubbed Digital Disruptions, the Future of Work in a Hybrid World. Be part of us as we mark the 2023 Career Week Fair. Welcome to Children's Corner. I am. Welcome to Children's Corner. Children's Corner. Children's Children's Corner. Oh my goodness. What? GE. Content carried in here is suitable for general family viewing. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's another wonderful day that you meet here for uh, how to break through English paper two. So last week we were here just uh, looking into paper one and the number of things that we highlighted, the number of things that we brought into perspective of how to handle this paper. So today I want us just to look into English paper two, a paper that is coded as 101 strop two. 101 strop, strop two. And with me in studio today, I have just uh, two sample papers. That is, uh, this is KCC 2019. That's the paper that was done two years ago. And then I also have uh, KCC, 2020. KCC 2020. This paper was done in March this year. So uh, we'll also be looking into them just as, uh, shortly. So just maybe a kind of a short review of uh, what we agreed last week. We said that English is divided into three papers, that is, uh, Paper one, one that is uh, what we call functional skills, functional skills uh, close test, and oral skills. They are, this paper carries uh, 60 marks of the total, that is uh, functional skills, close test, and oral skills. Then paper two, the paper that we are focusing on today uh, carries 80 marks, and this paper is divided into four different categories. That is where we have the comprehension, comprehension, then we have uh, an extract, an extract from a compulsory set text, and then from then we have the third part or the third question of this paper where we talk about either oral literature oral literature or uh, speaker or, or not or oral literature stroke poem and then the fourth part of this paper is what you talk about grammar so again this is the epicenter or the heart of this paper because it carries 80 marks so our lesson today is just going to focus on how we are going to get the 80 marks or at most get the best of this paper. Then later on, maybe in our next class, we'll be focusing on paper three, 
uh, paper three uh, carries again 60 marks. This is where we'll focus on uh, imaginative writing. Imaginative writing. Then we'll focus on an essay from a compulsory text. Essay from a compulsory text. And then we will also essays from uh, an optional text. So this one, this paper equally carries 60 marks. So if you add the three papers, then you realize that you need to end up with 200 marks. So at the end of this series of lessons, we'll just be focusing on how do we get the best of the 200 marks. So maybe a summary of the paper one, you can equally get them in this book. This is called Functional Writing Book. You'll get them on paper one. So today, let's just delve into paper two. So the objective of this lesson is to ensure that the learner is well versed or the learner is comfortable as much as possible in preparing for, for this paper. So my approach today will focus on five different things. That is, number one, what is tested. This is 101 stroke two. So look at it into five different ways. So the first is just going to look at the approach. What is tested? What is tested? Number two, I will look at the examination skills. Examination skills. Then number three, we are going to look at the tips the tips on how to handle each and every question. Then we'll also look at the challenges, the challenges the students face in handling different question. And the fifth aspect is penalties. Penalties are, are associated with uh, each and every question if we don't get it right. So I'm going to take us through this and remember my name is still Zach Opondo, a teacher of English and literature at Wahundura High School. So we want to look at what is tested. What is tested? That is English paper two, 101 stroke two. What is tested? Question one, as we said, this paper is divided into four different parts. Question one is what is called the comprehension. Comprehension. And comprehension usually carry 20 marks. Comprehension carries 20 marks on the aspect of what is tested. Number two, an extract from a compulsory text. Extract from compulsory text. Uh, then what is again tested here is question three, uh, poetry. Poetry stroke oral literature. And in this in this category, I'm going to give us the different poetries or oral literatures that have been tested uh, since we, st uh, we started testing this paper in 2006. So we have oral literature. So extract from compulsory text carries 25 marks. 25, this carries 20 marks. And then we look at grammar. Grammar that carries 15 marks. So this also carries 20 marks. So if you look at all of them, we end up with 80, 80 marks. So this is basically what you're going to focus on in this paper. So I want to look as just take us through uh, comprehension. And it's good to note that uh, this comprehension passages test us on emerging issues. If you look at KCC 2017, it tested on obesity. KCC 2018, there's a passage on discipline. KCC 2019, there's a passage on history. And KCC 2020, so it's talking about something to do with trade. So it can also test us on something to do with global warming. Maybe because we're in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this can, can also be an area of focus. So a variety of questions will be required. I uh, will require comprehension and inference skills, summary questions, note making, paraphrasing, semantics, and grammar. So I'll just take us through uh, maybe KCC 2020 that uh, we looked into. KCC 2020. So again, we have a paper here that talked about uh, coffee is the most abundantly produced uh, of the non-alcoholic beverages. It's a leading tropical commodity in international trade. 
and is the chief export crop of many of the Latin American and Caribbean countries. So this was a question that was facing us basically on coffee and basically the trade. Uh, when you're talking about how it spread, the coffee tree is a native of the highlands of the southern Ethiopia, and the name coffee derived from that of the highland district of Kaffa, where it was found from Ethiopia. It was taken across the Red Sea. So as we look at this comprehension, we just need to focus on what exactly do we need in order to score the best. And as I said, this question will test you on the comprehension skills. That is the ability to read and understand. Number two, it will test on your inference skills. That is, are you in a position to interpret the question? It will also ask you on the summary. Maybe you're told, like this paper, question uh, 1D, asks you that in not more than 60 words, trace the spread of the cultivation of coffee in the world. Again, that is just summary. Then it can also be it can also test you on note making. It also tests you on semantics, that is basically on the meaning. For example, question G uh, tested that explain the meaning of each of the following as used in the passage. Subordinates, blending, abundant, etc. It can also test you on aspects of grammar, whereby there's a question that asked students that from Ethiopia it was taken across the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia, right beginning with it. So again, that is going to test on your ability uh, to use grammar effectively. So I will look at various questions that are uh, various questions that are that are tested here. So we talk about uh, it is good to note that this paper comprehension will test on factual questions. So there are different types of questions. I think there are four different types of questions that are tested here. So we are talking about comprehension. Different types of questions. So we are agreeing that one, it will test you on factual questions. Factual questions. When I talk about factual questions, I'm referring to questions that can be gotten directly from the passage. If you look at KCC 2020, the paper that was done in March 2021, there was a factual question that will begin with something like, according to the passage, where did coffee get its name from? So that is a fact. You simply need to get to the, just get to the question. So these are questions that are based on facts or ideas from the passage. They are recall type of questions. And therefore, the student is simply expected to remember what he or she has read. So when attempting to recall type of a question, the learner is required to use the words or phrases from the paragraph. We are expected to use the word or the phrases from the paragraph. For example, so when you, you are asked like, uh, according to the passage, where did coffee get his name from? So you simply need to get to the, uh, to the, to the comprehension. So if you read paragraph two, is it paragraph two? Yes, paragraph two says, the coffee tree is native of, uh, is a native of the highlands of South, southern Ethiopia, and the name coffee is derived from that of the highland district of Kaffa. So a student can simply uh, uplift this directly and put it into his script, and therefore you just score your marks there. So the answer should be the word coffee is derived from Kaffa, a district in Ethiopia, in the, uh, a district in the highland, is a highland district of, in Ethiopia where it was, where it was discovered. So with the factual questions, you are simply in factual questions, you are simply expected to lift up, just get the question directly from the passage and then proceed with it. Lift the question directly from the passage and proceed with it. So number maybe another question we've talked about is the inference questions. Inference questions. So that is the type of question number two. Inference questions. Again, with inference questions, uh, these are questions that are not lifted directly from the passage. So the student is expected to do what? To infer from the details provided. Okay? The question may include uh, application questions. So maybe something like, what do you think the practice of growing coffee spread? Or why, sorry? Why do you think the, the practice of growing coffee spread to the rest of the world after the priest's discovery? So this one expects you to do, to do what? To give us your idea. You apply. Okay? Application is a student is expected to relate what has been read in the passage to a different situation. So again, uh, these are questions that require the student to make judgments. You're supposed to make judgments 
on ideas that have been presented. It's beginning with why. So you're supposed to make judgment, give a reason as to that is happening. Then question three, which is also usually tricky to students, is the summary question. Summary question, it can be a summary or simply not making. Again, this is also an area that it's good to note that most students uh, probably fail this simply because of missing the basics of writing the summary or basics of writing note making. So these are questions that requires you to apply the skills of note making, this, this, uh, apply the skills of uh, summary writing that you learned in class. So again, questions on summary, I, I want to divide them into two. That is on summary writing and then later on I'll talk about uh, note making as part of this. So in summary writing, the awards that will be used, uh, for example, in question cases 2020, it was like in not more than 60 words, trace the spread of cultivation of coffee in the world, in not more than 60 words. So a summary question will ask you on such kind of questions, in not more than, in about 30 words, in about 60 words. So these are the key words that you need to note. So a question on summary, it's a uh, it's become a quite common phenomenon because it's been tested in a number of times. Let me just give us a breakdown of uh, summary writing. It's been tested a number of times. I'm just, yes. 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020 has been testing us on summary. So again, these are skills that all of us need to embrace, need, need to learn, because from what we see, probably even in 2016, it was there. If you just learn this skill, like in 2020, it, this question carried six marks. So it's good to just learn this properly, the questions on summary. So what do you need to do? One, take note of the words used in about 30 words or in not more than 60 words or in not, yeah, mostly it's in, in about 60 or in not more than. So what do you need to know? If you're told in about 30, then that means you are given an allowance of positive or negative five. So you can write from 25 to 35 marks. If you're told in not more than, again, it allows the learner to have a positive, okay, in not more than ha allows the learner to have a positive of plus or minus five. But if you're told in about 30, you ne just need to write less. You you're given an allowance of negative. So again, uh, take note of that so, th so that your words cannot go beyond the, the stipulated number. So then, so what do you need to know that? It is worth noting, this examiner's tip here, it is worth noting that this question, nothing is marked beyond what is expected. So if I was asked to write 35, the question is in about 35 words. In about, in about 35 words. So that means I'll be given plus minus five. So any word that is beyond the 40th word is not marked. So it's good to note that so that you don't expect, you don't exceed that uh, by far. So uh, uh, it's good to note that. So in not making, we, that we've talked about summary now, in not making, the student must answer in point form. So when we talk about not making. So we noted about not making, there are key things you need to note here is your answers must be in point form. So point form, we look at things maybe to do with the asterisks, the numbering, the alphabetical numbering, etc. You can also use arrows. Just note that it must be in note form. Remember, in summary, summary must be in prose. It must be in continuous prose so that you don't, uh, if you write in point form, you'll be, it will be marked, but you will lose 50% of the mark. So if you have to score 60, if you have to go six out of six, you get everything correct. You'll, you'll score the six, then you lose 50. So that means you'll only end up with a, mini, a maximum of, of three marks. Again, in point form, in not making, if it is six marks and you write in prose, that is in in continuous sentences, you're going to lose 50%. So the maximum you can score is three marks. So again, just uh, 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 take note of that. This must be 
in not not form again you must use the indicators indicators that you're writing in not form indicators of not form is simply by the use of letters hyphen bullets etc it is important to note that a student who does not make notes when required is uh, is simply penalized the penalties is you will lose up to 50% of the marks so that is basically on summary questions then comprehension will also test you on grammar comprehension will also test you on grammar now when you talk about grammar these are the various aspects of grammar that you learn in class again KCC 2020 tested on that you're told from Ethiopia it was taken across the Red Sea so you write beginning with it KCC 2019 let's just look at it I know students you have it these papers with you again uh, KCC 2019 basically it did not have much grammar but it had uh, the aspect of semantics whereby you're told explain the meaning of each of the following words as used in the passage KCC 2016 yeah, 2018 let me just let's just look at KCC 2018 yes KCC 2018 again had grammar it was he say that a compression that was talking about discipline so the question was so discipline does not only stem from authority figures such as parents and teachers but also comes from the person the person's willingness to do right rewrite beginning with not only so again these are grammar questions that was going to test you about the use of correlatives it's good to note that let's see case another paper i've had i've have a series of papers here again maybe kcc 2016 yes kcc 2016 that is question the question on grammar identify other words that the author uses in the passage to mean mild corporal punishment that is a question on semantics explain the meaning of the following words again uh, that is semantics but it's good to note that grammar question never misses in when it comes to comprehension so uh, take note of that take note that it also tests you on that aspect of grammar the next thing that we want to focus on here is the question on evaluation again that is the fifth aspect of uh, the fifth type of question that is expected here so the fourth one the fifth one is evaluation questions evaluation questions these are questions that uh, it requires the student to give answers based on their own judgment so such kind of a question will begin with maybe what do you think or probably uh, with illustrations describe the attitude of the writer so again in that kind of a question you're supposed to simply evaluate and come up with the attitude so describe the attitude of of the writer maybe you need to give your answers uh, just answer those questions effective so in conclusion of a comprehension passage we are saying that one the learner must read and understand the passage so the exam tip here is the learner must read and understand the passage. So reading and understanding the passage involves us to employ the, uh, the skill of SQ3R. SQ3R is a skill uh, that we need to engage here. The survey, question, read, recite, review. So just you you have to you have to these are skills that is t is taught in paper three read the whole passage to get an idea of what is about read the questions given classify questions as either any of this whether it's a factual question inference question summary question grammar question or evaluation question then read the passage again with the questions in mind underlining any parts of the answer that is needed as i said at the beginning there are some questions that will require you to simply lift this directly from the passage so read and understand number two the answers must be given in correct tense if the question is in the past or if the question refers to something that is in the past 
ensure that your answers are given in the past. Number three, use complete sentences. So I've talked about uh, this, read and understand. We're also saying observe tense. Observe the tense of the question, particularly on the grammar. If it is a phrasal verb that is in the past, please just explain it in the past. Then the use of complete sentences. complete sentences. So again, when you're putting your answers, ensure that they are done or they are written in complete sentences. Then the questions on not making must be in point form. I've mentioned that here. If you're doing not making, you must write them in the not form. Summary write writing must be done in continuous prose. Full, complete sentences, beginning with a capital uh, letter, and ending in a final punctuation mark. And remember, final punctuation marks can be a question mark, a full stop, or an exclamative. Then questions on semantic give the meaning of words using the tense of the word in question. Give the meaning of the words using the tense of the word in question. So simply take note of that. Simply take note of that for us to... Yeah, just take note of that just to ensure that you get the correct tense. So uh, it's good to note these questions have been, uh, have just lift the answers. You can lift the answers directly from the passage. If probably you're wondering on how to put your answers, lift them directly from the passage and you continue. Then inference questions, you've also said it begins with things to do with in your opinion or probably what do you think, probably what's the attitude, there's also a question on styles that can be asked. QCC 2019 tested something on, on the styles that are used. Next thing we want to focus on, the next thing we want to focus on, probably you can be asked on how to describe an attitude. Again, you need to discuss this, maybe the attitude of the writer towards a particular thing, the attitude of the, white, the writer towards discipline. So again, attitude refers to the feelings expressed by the author, the speaker, and is arrived, arrived at using the words that the author has used. Some words that are used to describe attitude, particularly in question one, and I know this also applies in question two, in question three, that talks about uh, poetry. I'll just give you the words that are used to describe poet, uh, this in probably condemning, admiration. So I'll, I'll, I'll I, I came up with this referring to the passage that was talking about discipline, or condemning, condescending, critical, spiteful, scornful, contemptuous, appreciative, etc, etc. So again, take note of that. Summary questions, we've talked about that. N nowadays, uh, NEC has been so lenient on us when it comes to summary questions. They will always give you uh, two, two parts, beginning with uh, the rough copy. There'll be the rough, uh, the rough copy. So, so the, you'll, you'll also have a question on the rough copy, the, the, this part. So the neck has been so lenient, rough copy, and then there is uh, the fair copy. So you'll realize that there's also the fair copy that is used. So the rough part, this is where you're supposed to do your rough work. Uh, whatever you want to highlight, just write it here. So that when you come to the, the fair copy, this is now when you use uh, the prose forms just to put everything in perspective. So take note of that. Uh, KCC 2019 also had the same format, the rough copy and the fair copy. It had uh, the rough copy where you're supposed to do your rough work and the fair copy. Now this is the part that you're supposed to uh, write the final, uh, your, your final answer in continuous prose. So again, the rough copy, sometimes you can cross it, sometimes you cannot, but remember uh, whether you cross or not, there's nothing much because it's usually not marked, but I advise students not to cross it because supposing if you lack time, sometimes the examiner can look for points on the rough work, but it's good just to plan yourself so well so that you ensure that everything is included. Uh, I've, I've also said that it must be in prose form because if not, 50% uh, of the marks will be deducted. Uh, this sometimes can also be tested on paraphrasing, maybe as you're told, in your own words. Again, candidates should not Candidates should not use the words. They should not use the words in the passage. Okay, you should use its equivalent. You, the use of uh, uh, 
synonyms, okay? Use different words, but maintain the meaning. The meaning of the original or the exact sentence must be maintained, but you must use different words. Some of the challenges that we face here include failure to give your responses in full sentences. You simply uh, uh, jerky, your, flow, you, your sentences are simply jerky. You'll miss marks there. Failure to interpret or to interpret an, the, the question. It will give you uh, a different, you'll definitely get it wrong. Failure to respond to the question's demand. Again, every time you sit down to answer a question, underline the demand. What is the demand of this question? If you don't get the demand, then definitely you'll get it wrong. Factual errors, also here. M misspelling words, okay? When you misspell the words, particularly in grammar, the grammar part of this, you're going to, to lose the marks. Making notes, this is also a challenge. Students probably write in continuous form when they're told to make notes. Or they simply make notes when they're told to write in what? In summary. Expression errors, again, this one falls in the category of grammar. The subject verb agreement, you simply switch the tense. So those are some of the challenges that are met in this paper. Penalties that are encountered, particularly in question one, include when you have factual errors, you'll be penalized. When you omit keywords, especially in, uh, in summary writing, you'll be penalized. Uh, we've talked about expression errors. Again, NB is an, something I want students to note here. NB, number one, for comprehension questions, a candidate can lift the entire paragraph. If you're not sure of what the answer is, simply lift the entire paragraph. If you lift the entire paragraph, it is to your advantage because now the examiner will have to read that paragraph and find the answer for himself or just pick the relevant part. Number two, the answer can be written anywhere. You can write the answer anywhere in the paper. Yeah, just ensure that you refer the examiner to where the answer is. Just guide the examiner correctly. Again, candidates are not penalized for grammatical errors in question one, except in summary and grammar. So the other parts, maybe the factual questions, again, the grammar may not apply, but it's always prudent that you use the correct grammar. So having looked at comprehension questions, I want now to introduce us to the except questions. Except questions are tested from the two compulsory books. Every, after a period of time, K, uh, KICD issues us with set books. So the two books that will be examined in KCC 2021, compulsory include A Doll's House, A Doll's House, and uh, blossoms of the savannah. So this is a play. This is, oh sorry, yeah, this is a play, and this is a novel. Historic, uh, from history, these books are tested interchangeably. Like last year, we had a question, an essay paper three coming from a doll's house. So it means that paper two the extract was from the blossoms of blossoms of the savannah. So if it goes by the trend, then it means KCC 2021, you'll have an essay from blossoms of the savannah and an extract from, from a doll's house. So passages in the extracts are picked from either the compulsory text novels or the play. So paper two question will be derived from either of this. So 2020, we had an essay, this appeared in paper three, this appeared in paper two. This is KCC 2020. So if it goes with that, then it means now this year we'll have an essay, this will appear in paper two, this will appear in paper three. So, so they usually 
exchange. They usually exchange. So take note of that. But again, for preparation purposes, it's good so that as a teacher, just ensure that your students do practice in both the books so that they, they get a what? They get a clear understanding of what is needed here. So how is it tested? Okay. Areas tested, extract uh, uh, focuses on the episodic scenes, the important scenes in the text that propel the plot. There are key scenes in the book. There are key scenes in Blossoms of the Savannah. For example, the arrival of Olekaelo in Nasila. That is a key scene. Again, there's a key scene in a doll's house. For example, talking about uh, uh, in a doll's house, the buying of the Christmas tree, the tarantella dance, the arrival of Krogstad, the arrival of Dr. Rank, the flatting, how Dr. Rank uh, flats with Nora. Those are key scenes that are tested. So when you talk about an extract, it will begin from a particular page and end or ends on a particular page. How is it tested? It's good to note that a variety of questions that capture plot development. What is tested here? So we say we are going to focus on areas tested, how is tested, the examination tips, the challenges, and the penalties. So we talked about areas. Areas tested, you said compulsory text. In our case, we have blossoms of savannah, of the savannah, and then a doll's house. Then, uh, how is this tested? The how, how it is tested? Variety of questions that will capture you on, will capture what? Plot development. Okay. It will also test you on characterization. different characters that are in the book. You should know that Olekailo is a character in Blossoms of the Savannah. Know that Nora is a character in a doll's house. It will also test you on the themes. This question can also test on aspects of style. It will also test you on semantics. That is meaning. And then this question will also test grammar. So every time you read an extract, you need to note the following. Plot development. How is that extract continuing, uh, helping us to continue with the book? How is it helping us to develop the plot? Characterization. Which characters are involved in a particular, in that particular test? Which subjects, which themes are there? Which styles are there? Meaning or probably that you are given two words that you are supposed to give a meaning, and then the grammar. So I'm going to focus on KCC 2019 and KCC 2020. KCC 2019 and KCC 2020. So KCC 2019, we had an extract from a doll's house that it is a part of the book that began with, uh, in the doorway, the children are saying, Mother, the stranger has gone out to the gate then Nora says yes dears I know but don't anyone uh, don't tell anyone about the stranger do you hear not even Papa then children says no mother but will you come and play again no 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 not now but mother you promised us yes but I can't now run away in I have such a lot to do run away in my sweet little darling so some of the question that were gotten from them is is place the excerpt in its immediate context. Place the excerpt in its immediate context. So this is a question that we categorize in the part that is called the context questions. What happens immediately before or after? So it will ask you on either put it in an immediate context or sometimes it will ask you in what happened immediately before this or what happened after this. KCC 2019, what I'm referring to, candidates were expected to say what happens before and after. So the key words that are used here, key words that are used in a context question, so you can be asked to put it in its immediate context. So if the word is immediate context, then you need to note that 
explain what happens before and after. Before and after. If you are told to give, to state what happened after, after the excerpt. Excerpt. Again, explain what happened simply after. If you are asked before, then you are simply supposed to give us the scenes or the episode that comes before. So, sometimes we ask, uh, students ask, how do you therefore arrive at? All you need to take note of is, don't go too far into the book. Don't go too far away from the context. Give us the episode that is leading to that particular expert. Don't go too far ahead or too far back. Again, remember this has been tested differently. 2016, 2020, 2019, uh, 2018, there was such kind of a question. So don't go too far. Number two, on the extra questions is maybe something on the styles. Identify the style that is there. Let's say, yes, KCC 2019 was asking, identify and illustrate two stylistic devices used in this excerpt. What you need to do is identify the style. So we talk about styles. When you talk about styles, you need to illustrate, identify the styles, identify and then do what? Illustrate. Identify and illustrate the style. Candidates, the challenge here is, candidates, sometimes they stroke unrelated styles. Maybe somebody is talking, going to talk about a style of probably juxtaposition, and then they relate it with maybe symbolism. So again, remember, this is not correct. Don't, re don't stroke unrelated styles. Sometimes you'll also be asked on the themes. Again, KCC 2019, identify and illustrate two themes brought out in the play. Remember to identify the theme and illustrate. The challenge is students sometimes also stroke themes which are not related. If maybe you are talking about the theme of education, maybe this education or probably in uh, there's something to do with the patriarchy. Yeah, so don't stroke themes which are not related, okay? Don't stroke themes which are not related. You can also be asked for characterization. Again, identify the character and use the words that describe them. Identification alone does not score. No, sorry. Illustration alone does not score, but identification does. No penalties for grammatical errors here. So again, but again, as we encourage students, ensure you always uh, follow the rules of grammar. Factual errors. We are, you will be penalized on this. If you misspell the name of Nora, the Nora that we have in a doll's house is this, Nora. So if you add H, then we are simply saying you are introducing your own character. So these are factual errors which are penalized. Okay? Which are, there, there, was, there was a major challenge particularly when we were dealing with the book, uh, The River and the Source, we had a war, a war Kembo, but students would refer to a war. So again, these are factual errors. So avoid factual errors, okay? That is an area that is penalized. So I want us to move to question three. Uh, that is the poetry questions since 2006. Question three. This is a question that uh, focuses on either poetry or oral literature. So again, good to note that it's been tested. Both of them have been tested interchangeably. 2006, we had the poem called Tough. 2007, we had a poem called Sympathy. 2008, we had a poem called The Splash. 2009, we had an oral narrative. 2010, we had a poem, The Song of the Wagon Driver. 2011, we had oral literature. 2012, we had a poem by Klick, Klisch, a German, a German uh, poet. 2013, we had a poem called The Outcast. 2014, we had a poem, Listen, My Dear Bride. 2015, there was an oral narrative. 
2016, we had a poem, The Road Less Taken. 2016, 2017, sorry, we had a narrative. 2018, we had a poem, The Man I Killed. 2019, there was an oral narrative. 2020, we had a poem, Love Is Not All. The question we pose at this point is, what will be tested in the year 2021? That is the role of NEC. I will not predict any, but it's good that a student focuses on both. Just prepare on both. So what is tested here? Areas that are tested here are contemporary poems. In poetry question, we test you on contemporary poems. Poems that are fo focusing on the things that are affecting us directly. There's a poem written by Every Stander. Uh, this is the poem that was talking about Mwanaenshi. It's a contemporary poem. Again, that nature of a poem can be tested. How is it tested? Number one, the literal or the implied meaning. The literal or the implied meaning. I, I always try to encourage students, don't try to overthink. When the poem has been put before us, love is not all. It is not meat nor drink, nor slumber nor a tool against a uh, ray, nor yet a, f a floating spa to men that, that sink. That was simply that poem. So students, don't overthink about the poem. Don't try to start asking yourself, what could this be? What is meant by love is not all? Is it symbolic of something else? Not really. That poem is simply about love is not all. Let me read. There's a poem called The Wedding Eve. Should I or should I not take the oath to love forever? This person I know little about. Does she love me or my car or my future, which I know little about? Will she continue to love me when the future she saw in me crumbles and fades into nothing, leaving, me, leaving the naked me to love without hope? Will that smile she wears last through the hazards to come when fate strike across the dreams of tomorrow? Like the clever passenger in a faulty plane wear her life jacket and jump out of the lifesaver, leaving me crash into the unknown? What magic can I see? To see what flies beneath her angel face and well-lit hair. To see her hopes and dreams before I take the oath. To love forever. We are both wise chess players. She makes a move. I make a move. And when we trap each other out of our secret dreams, hoping to win against each other. That's a poem that was written again by the dear professor Everett Stander. So, the first question is, Comment on the title of the poem. Remember, it's simply about what? The Wedding Eve. So you're simply supposed to comment on the title. The Wedding Eve, okay? So don't overthink poetry. Don't try to think in space. It's simply going to test you on the literal meaning. Poetry question will also test on the characterization. Identify maybe who is the persona. The themes. It will test you on the message. The style paraphrasing, the mood, the tone, the attitude, semantics, and grammar. It's good just to, uh, the skills that we used in analyzing literature, analyzing a set book, are the similar skills that I use in analyzing paper two poetry. Remember, paper one poetry was focusing majorly, paper one po poetry focuses majorly on sound. Paper two poetry is going to focus on what? issues, the styles, okay? Attempts, maybe the areas, the tips on the poetry, tips on how to get the best of poetry is what the poem is about. Simply explain it stanza by stanza, okay? Ensure you get the main theme. Explain it and illustrate it. Explore the message stanza by stanza. Most poems have a simple, literal meaning. Okay, if the w if you fail to get the correct noun, maybe for the question that is asked, 
just explain it, elaborate and get correct, okay? If a poem is about exploitation, remember the theme probably will be on something to do with ex uh, uh, oppression. Let me read again the poem by our dear Everett Standard. It talks about Mwanainchi. And therefore there's this poem. You embarrass me, Mwanainchi. Why do you embarrass me with your questions about the new Mercedes I bought, the large farm I own, the houses, the wives, an inflated stomach? Mwanainchi, why do you threaten me with your threats? The threats in your blood sh bloodshot eyes fixedly pointed at me wherever I go. Like if you are ready to release the arrow that will deflate me into nothingness. Even the watchmen, the dogs, the police are all not enough to protect me from your increasing shouts to protest. If you're, a, uh, if you're a Kenyan and you've been living in this country for some time, you'll discover that this is a poem that relates with that. Then somebody will ask you, what is the theme? It's simply about uh, the non-performing nature of the what? Of a politician. So, again, tips is identification. Identify the style that is asked there. If you're given a style, identify that style. Is it symbolism? Just identify it. And then do what? Illustrate. The mood. Again, the mood is simply the atmosphere. Okay? The atmosphere in the air. Okay? Anxiety, uncertainty, restlessness, etc. Then, when you ask about the tone, the tone is simply the manner of speech. It's determined by the subject matter. It's determined by the theme. It's determined by the what? by the message, okay? Usually, the last stanza determines the, the tone. If you look at KCC 2016, the last stanza will determine the tone. Something else that will be tested in poetry is attitude. Attitude. Yeah, remember, we also have, we always have tone, mood, and attitude. So they can be tested interchangeably. Again, just identify. Attitude is simply the feeling. Remember we said that mood is the atmosphere. The tone is the manner of speech. The choice of words that are used there is determined by the subject. Then you have the attitude, the feeling towards something. What is the poet's feeling towards corruption? Okay, the choice of words. It will be tested on characterization. What do we learn about a person? Okay? There's a poem about uh, the introduction. There's a poem called The Introduction that goes with, perhaps it was because of his Eugene shirt. Again, what is the, the characterization? What, who is being addressed? Again, KCC 2016 focused on that. Semantics. Semantics. Yeah, KCC 2020. There was something on semantics. Explain the meaning of each of the following words, nagged. And then we had sell. It can also be tested on uh, application. We say, what lesson can we learn from this poem? It's good to note that when I talk about poetry, the lessons must be stated in the positive. So oral narratives, again, I said, question three is tested interchangeably. Either the poetry or the oral narrative in the manner in which I had stated. So topics and areas tested include classification of oral narrative, the features evident in that particular oral narrative, characterizations, uh, the cultural aspects, aspects of translation, the loss of sound patterns, especially this major in paper one, uh, things to do with uh, what is lost. The moral lesson, I've said, the lesson must be stated in the positive, okay? We should love each other. Don't put it in the negative when talk about uh, the oral narratives. So, oral poetry, uh, we talk about, maybe let's move into grammar. So again, when you talk about oral narratives, just take your time, read through. Sometimes you'll be asked, identify the use, identify the effect of the poem, effect of the song in that. It gives it the local aesthetic. Sometimes it breaks the monotony of what? Of narration. So again, identify your style and give it effect. Identify your style and give its effect. So, the fourth part of this paper, it carries 15 marks and is very critical. This is where most students 
get almost nothing because of not because it is technical but simply because of carelessness grammar under grammar remember we use all aspects of grammar all rules all rules apply if you are told to rewrite the sentence rewrite that sentence if you are told if you are rewriting ensure your sentence begins with a capital letter and ends in a final punctuation mark now this paper will test you on all the aspects grammar from form 1 to form 4 direct and indirect speech this has been tested in almost every paper noun derivations 2017 2020 the use of ambiguity 2017 2019 inversions beginning with the predicate negative signifiers the the, the, the correlatives hardly not only but also not only things to do with that they scarcely no sooner okay use of wa use of had just to begin the sentence it's been there cases 2017 had an elaborate set of questions on that punctuation marks inserting the appropriate punctuation mark case c 2016 the use of participles gerunds it's there the use of correlative conjunctions again neither nor not only but also that was there case c 2020 the use of connectors was then case c 2019 the use of idioms phrasal verbs i know students when they see phrasal verbs they start seeing nightmares and they wonder whether these things exist on earth yes it's good just to learn the phrasal verb all you need to do about phrasal verb is be keen on the tense 2016 2020 talked about that filling in gaps with the most appropriate words that is case c 2019 there's a question like fill in the blank space with the correct form of the words in bracket and had not recovered from her dash bread encounter with robbers so again you're supposed to choose at uh, the base so just determine which word is missing is it a subject is it part of the subject or part of the predicate if it is the part of the predicate is it the verb or is it the noun then that will give you the correct answer the word choice again 2015 2019 focused on that position of adverbs again good to note that adverbs simply modify what they add information to the verb they modify the verb so take note of that prepositions it's also an area that you need to focus on and finally the meaningful sentences so as we talk about uh, english paper 2 as i said in summary is this paper carries 80 marks i'm just going to give us a summary even as we conclude the paper carries 80 marks and for the last several years it's always the second paper after paper 1 then we have paper 2 this paper focuses on comprehension some books will call it the unseen text it focuses on an extract from a compulsory text an extract from a compulsory text it will also focus on oral literature stroke poem poetry and then the paper will focus on grammar so with that uh, we think that at this point the students will be able to uh, just as a should you have any question just go to the comment section of this live broadcast either on facebook or on youtube just put your uh, put your question there and we'll be glad to answer like last week there was a question from a uh, brighter girls whether you can uh, adopt uh, you can adopt the the block format in writing letters again it's good to note that just encourage your students uh, uh, baraza mr baraza just encourage your students to use either the format as long as there is consistency so i want to thank you so much students for taking your time to listen to this i want to wish you all the best in your kcc paper the next lesson will be focusing on the dynamics of how to answer kcc paper 3 I've been your teacher Zaku Kondo, a teacher of English and literature at Wakondo.